Yeah, so first of all, uh, my apologies for not being here. I just heard that half of you have never been to a WESM meeting, so they're there for the first time. For me, it's the first time not being to a WESM meeting in person, so uh, that's a change. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't make it. There was too much stuff going on this quarter, so I have to give a couple of presentations remotely. And I'm particularly happy to give this uh, presentation uh, at CMU, even if just remotely, and you will see in a moment why that is. So I suppose quite a few in the room are familiar with formal language semantics and this being CMU in particular, but let me motivate it any, anyway, the, the kind of work we're doing here and doing with WebAssembly in general. So here's kind of like a little example, an excerpt from a very popular language specification. And in case you don't recognize it, this is the JVM from the JVM specification and its very first edition some few years ago in the 90s, I think. And this is what it had to say at the time about bytecode verification. And this is all it had to say about bytecode verification. So just these two quite hand wavy, I would say, uh, paragraphs, and that was all there was. And unsurprisingly, this, this led to problems down the road, right? So there were bugs discovered, soundness bugs even, uh, implementations disagreed on how to interpret this. And moreover, they also found that uh, it's actually quite hard to implement because if you want to do it correctly in the way it was envisioned originally with the JVM, you had to do a fixed point uh, iteration on the bytecode to, to type check it. So later, then they change it to there's a new method for doing that with so-called stack maps and so on and so forth. I won't go into that here. But the whole point is, this is not how you should be doing it, obviously, right? This just leads to problems. So what's the situation today with the JVM? They fixed all that. And this is what we have today. And I'm not showing you the actual text defining bytecode verification. I'm just showing you an excerpt from the table of contents of the JVM spec. And all this is now bytecode verification. So it grew from two hand wavy paragraphs to more than 160 pages, right? Just bytecode verification, nothing else. And that also makes you wonder, doesn't it? Like, okay, it shouldn't be just two paragraphs, but should it really be 160 pages? I mean, the JVM has a bit of stuff in it, but it's not that complicated. So something went wrong here as well, I would argue. Um, so we should be able to do better, right? And we know how to do better, and we have been knowing how to do better for a long time. And one of the pioneers of doing better was this book. Um, and one author here you might recognize at CMU is Bob Harper. So this is the specification of standard ML. This book came out in 1990. And it, it was the first general purpose language basically with a completely form, complete formalized semantics specification, both execution and, and type checking. And there was follow-up work also at CMU primarily by Bob Harper and his group to uh, also mechanize it to have a machine verified uh, version of this semantics and verified with the 12th theorem prover at the time. So to me, this always was a huge inspiration. I always thought that this is how this it should be done. It's so much better than what we had been doing before, which is basically some English prose and praying and wishful thinking, right? And usually the wishful thinking goes wrong. Um, so this is much better. And this is also what inspired us with WebAssembly quite a bit. So I'm I'm happy to say that with WebAssembly, we put this from kind of like, I mean, you standard ML was the general purpose language, but it had still characteristics of an academic language, naturally. But we were now able to pull that into a mainstream technology. And WESM really is a fully formalized language, I'm I'm happy to say. Um, and it's not just formalized, it's also fully mechanized, at least. Uh, up to version two, I think. Um, right, and and this is great. And uh, there are two, a couple of things to note here. So, so this is not just an afterthought. We really did that more or less from the get go. It's and it's now an integral part of the design process. When you write proposals, you have to come up with a formalization. I would also argue that it was quite a success because. Um, since we published the, the semantics of WebAssembly and the design in our PLDI paper, 
um, there basically has been no serious spec bug discovered since, and also no serious incompatibility between implementations, none as far as I can tell. Maybe I'm missing something. But if they were, they were extremely minor and just implementation bugs, really, not ambiguities in the specification. Um, I mean, to be fair, a lot of that is also due to the test suite we have as part of the whole specification process as well. But I would argue that the clean, cleaner and more minimal design that was kind of a implication of the formalization played an uh, important role here as well. So, yeah, a lot of this... Uh, is based on the pioneering uh, work of, of standard ML. Um, but I also want to point a couple of things where we differ from what standard ML does. So the first thing is that WebAssembly is really an end-to-end -end formalization, right? So in the ML definition, it has type checking and, and execution, but not, not much beyond that. Um, but we really have a, a complete end-to-end -end formalization from the first byte to the last bit. So everything, including parsing, linking, even numerics are specified to the last bit, including floats. So there is no leeway of like going on here. And of course, being a bit newer, we can use a bit more modern approach to, so to defining the semantics. So we use a small step reduction semantics, not a big step one like SML still did. And we have the usual modern way of doing a syntactic soundness proof with the right fellow as a method and as you would expect, as everybody does on paper, right? Um, with respect to the mechanization, I also mentioned that, so what Hopper and others did with SML is basically they first uh, created a completely different formalization of SML that was not the one that's in the book, but one that was more based on type theory and that's what they actually mechanized. So there was quite a, distance between the mechanization and the actual standard. Whereas with Wesson, these uh, mechanizations that we have, um, they're really a direct representation of the paper semantics to the degree possible, right? As direct as possible. Um, the biggest difference though is the, the, web, uh, the, the SML definition was really nice. It just consisted of rules and it looked very elegant and, and stylized and everything because mainly because there was almost no uh, written word in it, right? It was almost all rules. Um, so we could not do that, right? That would just not be politically possible for an industrial technology. So we had to make this compromise that we have a standards document that contains all the formal semantics, but it also has to contain uh, plain English explaining the same thing. So basically it has both the declarative semantics and the algorithmic semantics in some stylized English. And they're intended to be equivalent um, and the whole point is having for having this English is to aid accessibility, right? Because we have to be realistic. Most programmers and even compiler folks, they are not particularly familiar with, with uh, formal semantics and they really want to read the, the prose, English prose to understand what's going on. But of course, one hope is having both next to each other is that we can help uh, to improve understanding of formal semantics because if you see it next to each other, maybe you get some insights too. So to make that a bit more concrete, here's what we had in our PLDI paper originally for WebAssembly. This was the complete semantics just on two pages. So the left is the, the reduction rules. So that is everything you need to know about execution, but parameterized over numer numerics. And the right-hand side is, is the complete validation rules. It's not even one page. So, but in the actual standards document, this is what it looks like instead. So here's an ex a snippet from execution. So you recognize these reduction rules that you saw before. They're sprinkled out between text. And this is the, the prose text you see here. And that is supposed to be saying the, the same thing more or less, but in more like understandable English. And similarly with... With validation, you have typing rules here, and unfortunately, the layout is a bit terrible. That is due to the tool chain we're using. But again, you have kind of English sentences trying to express the same thing. And the idea here is that the prose is really, it's not just the idea, that's how I created it. It's a manual text rendering of the formal rules. I manually translated all the formal rules into English. 
And of course, that blew up the equivalent of the two pages we saw you just saw before into roughly seven pages for the equivalent. And it was a very laborious process to do that. And also for, for reasons, we had to use some version of Markdown, or more precisely restructured text to write in that has its own problems. And this is also work that's not just done once we were done with language because we have many proposals in the making, right? And you basically have to face this all over again with every proposal. So we have quite a few of them, eight, last I counted eight were completed and more than 25, probably 30 at this point that are active work. Um, and they can be quite large. The largest one we had was was the diff to the whole spec repo of merging that proposal in was more than a hundred thousand lines of changes, which completely blew the the GitHub UI that can't handle that. But anyway, I mean most of that was test suit anyway, but roughly 20, 25 percent was actual spec. And for doing these these merges and proposals, we have a code review process, right? So we we have to read that stuff. And both LaTeX is is, a, is really a write only language, and Markdown is also very tedious to write and read and very error prone. To give you a sense of that, here's like a small like one snippet, just execution rules for select as they would appear in the document. And this is what you have to write by hand. And this is a very simple example still. It's like just one that I was able to fit on a single slide, right? But you see all this annoying markup you have to do here, this for cross-reference for math. And the the LaTeX really becomes unreadable when it becomes more complex. And this is really very simple one there, much more horrible rules. Um, but all of that has to be written manually, right? So these are like, and these are just some of the artifacts that we have as part of the WebAssembly spec. And for every proposal, you have to deliver all these artifacts. So there are like the formal rules I just showed in LaTeX. You have to write the pros. You also have to write uh, the reference interpreter, which is written in OCaml, which I haven't mentioned before, which is sort of like yet another representation of the same thing. And you have to come up with a test suite. And then some other people, not the proposal champions, we're not quite there yet, but eventually somebody also has to do all the mechanization work, right? So update the cock definitions and, and proofs. And that is yet another formulation of kind of the same thing. So clearly there's a lot of redundant work here and a lot of uh, extensive work and um, that should not be like that. That doesn't scale very well. And of course we knew it wouldn't scale very well when we started this, but at the time, we really didn't know how, how else to do it. So like six, seven years ago, we neither had the technology nor the resources, nor did we really know the requirements, how to kind of automate this. Um, but now we do. Like last year at some Dachstuhl on WebAssembly, on the foundations of WebAssembly, like the stars essentially have aligned. So several groups got together. That was some people from the CG, including me, and then folks who have worked on the WASM cert mechanization, like Conrad, who's in the room, I suppose. And then um, Sukyung's, uh, Sukyung Ryu's group from KAIST, who had some experience of doing like natural language processing for language spec with ECMAScript. And we came together and talked and figured out, well, we can actually do it. We can do something better. And that is what I, my actual topic is of this talk, which is SpecTech. Um, and that is the idea of putting away with writing all this manual stuff here and instead just writing these couple of lines for the same thing, right? So essentially, you're just writing out the formal rules in some nice ASCII that you can actually see on and read on the screen. And then everything else is generated from it, including the, in particular the, all the pros, but also all the cross-reference, so all the blue things here are actually hyperlinks and they all had to be written manually, but now they are all generated automatically. So that's the idea. We want a DSL that allows you to do that. And it's a DSL specifically for authoring the WESM spec. And uh, the specification of WESM now then in this DSL is supposed to be the single source of truth for the semantics and the definition of WESM now, uh, up to that. And it's translatable into all these artifacts. In particular, the most interesting part being it's translatable into natural language, right? Uh, for some definition of natural. Um, 
and it's supposed to be easy to write and read and give the the spec author essentially kind of like a Visivic experience. So we didn't want to invent yet another completely different notation because many of them are already struggling with the formalism in the spec. So they should be able to write that down more or less in the way they expect to see it later when it's rendered. And of course, there's also a whole lot of extra error checking now, which you didn't have when you just were manually writing LaTeX. Um, and of course, there, things like that have been tried before. There are various frameworks that allow you to do th things like that. For example, there's uh, Odd and Lem, there's something like the K framework, all of which are at least allow you to do some of these things, but they were much more general and so both like not uh, too general and not uh, general enough for enabling us to do exactly what we need to do, like really generating the exact document we or something close to the document we already have using something close to the notation we already have and um, understanding enough about the specifics of WebAssembly and the meta notation used in the spec um, to to make that an easy task. So by really specializing it all to WebAssembly and in spec, we simplified the problem quite significantly. So for example, all the meta notations just built into the DSL, all the meta notation used in the spec. And I should also point out that this is not supposed to be a theorem prover, right? So all like the meta theory, the mechanized meta theory that we want to continue doing, that will continue to happen in something like COC. Um, this is just essentially a preprocessor that allows you to generate the cock definitions on which you can then do it and keep them in sync with the actual definition. So the overall picture is this. Um, it's kind of like a compiler infrastructure if you want. So you have as input the, the definition of WebAssembly in the SpecTech DSL, and it goes through various compiler pipeline stages, and then it has various backends that can generate various artifacts. And I will get back to this picture in, in a while, just flashing it at you so you have a rough idea of what is happening. Um, before I go into some of the details, I want to say something, some of the main concepts of these DSL. It tries to be very minimal and kind of generic, so they are really only, depending on how you count, like three, four main, main features in there. So the first one is it allows you to define abstract syntax, right? So something like this. And this is really, if, if you are familiar with programming languages or theorem provers, you can read that as, as a data type definition or an inductive type definition. And where you can have something that's kind of like constructors, something that is a bit of like notation. So the arrow here, for example, is a special atom that the parser recognizes that allows you to define your custom notation. You can use stars to define sequences or question marks for options like you would on paper. And here's a bit more interesting example. That's a snippet of the instruction set of WebAssembly and the way you would specify it. And so the constructors can really more or less look like um, what you see on paper and in the WebAssembly instruction set, the text format. And in cases where it can't because the, the syntax of the DSL is not quite as uh, um, general as, or we couldn't quite make it quite as general, they, they, we have some generic system of like, for example, you can have hints for how we, the these things should be rendered. So const instructions, you have to write them like this in the DSL, but they will be rendered like this. Um, and then, and syntax definitions, so type definitions, they can also be indexed. So they can have parameters. So for example, you can define integers of width n like this, so like subrange types, you can define floats, I skipped that the exact definition. And you can also use that to define type families, which are defined by pattern matching on their on their parameters. So for example, to define the representation of constants of the different types, you can match on the type and equate them with the right representation type. Um, similarly for operators, so here's like generic instruction for with binary operators, and there are quite a few of them, but they differ depending on the type. Uh, for which this operation is defined. And again, that can be done by type families and indices. And then the other big feature is a, is a generic way to define what the DSL calls relations. And that is the, 
the big feature that allows us to define both like typing rules and reduction rules. So for example, to do typing, well, first we define some auxiliary syntax to, to define contexts. And for that, we're using this sort of record notation, which is also built into the DSL. So here I'm simplifying a little bit. The context just knows about functions and globals and locals. Um, and then I can declare a relation, like basically a judgment form, right, if you want. And in this case, it's the, it's the judgment form for instruction typing. So it is a context and it types an instruction with a function type. And again, this just implicitly defines notation. So the, the turnstile here in the colon are really just meta level notation, which I can pick here to make it a bit more readable. But I could pick completely different symbols here if I wanted to. And having defined this, I can then populate it with rules. So every rule has to have a name. And then it's really just the rule, like you write them out as you would on paper, more or less, except that it's all ASCII. For example, the NOP instruction um, doesn't take anything from the stack. It doesn't push anything to the steps stack. So this is just epsilon uh, boring one. The drop instruction takes some arbitrary T value of type T from the stack and returns nothing. Um, select expects three things on the stack, two values of some type T, of the same type T, and a, an integer, which is a Boolean, and it returns one. If you know WebAssembly, you know all this. Um, here's one for globals, um, which has a site condition. So basically, you can read this like inference rules, but upside down, right? All the, the premises are below the conclusion. Um, so this look just looks up the type of, of X in the context, similarly calls. And here's an actual inductive, inductive rule for blocks, which has a premise for typing the, the nested instruction sequence. Um, and it also extends the context locally with the new label. I won't go into the details of what all that means, just to give you a flavor of how you write that down and how, how natural it's supposed to look. Um, and similarly with reduction, can do the same thing. We again define some auxiliary uh, some auxiliary syntax here, like for values in the store and configurations. And then we have two main re re reduction relations. One is just the general step relation from configuration to configuration. And then we have a variant for pure reductions, which just involve instructions and, and omit the, the store or the state from the configuration. This is just a way to avoid clutter, right? And you can, there's then just one rule that allows you to infer a general step from a pure step where store and frame remain uh, unmodified. And then we can write, for example, pure reductions for the drop instruction. So if you have a sequence of instructions, the first being a value, so in this case, values are just const instruction and followed by a drop, then that reduces to the empty instruction sequence. Select, you already saw a few slides earlier, so I will not repeat that. And again, it's just to give you an idea. And for globals, we use some site conditions here, which use some auxiliary uh, meta functions. So that is the, the last feature of, of, the, of Spectac is it allows you to define like meta level functions. And in this case, the, these are really very simple functions that are just shorthands to avoid having to write this notation all over the place. Um, so yeah, as you saw, there's quite a bit of built in notation here, just to summarize that a little bit. Of course, you have arithmetics, you have this notion of records that you can define and access and also compose. Important one is sequences, which are kind of form of lists, if you want, which you can form an index into. You can also update them or take their length. And then the, the most interesting one perhaps is iteration. So you can write something like star on some arbitrary expression. And I wanna go into that a bit more detail on a slide like here. So essentially this is what you see in many papers as the overbar notation, right? On paper, you often use the overbar notation, which has the disadvantage that it's not easy to write in ASCII. And it also doesn't, doesn't scale well. It, it becomes quite cluttered quickly. So here we'd use something that's a bit more familiar, like from regex, so you just write star. And that also has the nice advantage that we can generalize it. So we can have variants like E plus E question mark, which have some 
implied side conditions about the length of the sequence. You can also name the length actually with the meta variable, and then you can use that directly. And this can be generalized further that you also have an iteration variable. So if you write this, then this i is implicitly the sequence of, of numbers from zero to n minus one, and you can use that in certain examples where you need to have this index inside the iteration. And of course, these things can nest arbitrarily. Um, I and yeah, so because they can nest, variables can now occur under stars or several stars, and which means that you have to know what's going on. And on paper, usually that's kind of clear from context, but since we now need to process it uh, properly mechanically and do type checking, we have to do what's called dimension inference in the front end. So basically that checks that all the meta variables that appear in rules and definitions are used consistently with respect to the iterations they occur under. And they, it does so by assigning dimensions to each variable. And the dimension is the smallest sequence of iterators it occurs under. And that is because you can have mixed stuff. Like here's an example where I have some X star, which also occurs here under some iterated comparison along with Y. But Y also occurs uh, on the top level without an iteration. And, by that, and at first, that y is actually a scalar and x is um, is a vector, and that this is actually a broadcast of y over the axis. Um, and you can nest them and name them. And in this case, for example, z now has a two-dimensional dimension. Um, and of course, if you use things together, like here, that also implies that certain Im Im constraints on the length of sequences, if I have something like X and Y is used under star, and then I use Y and Z under star, and it means they all have to have the same length, right? Otherwise, these uh, things wouldn't be well-defined. And this is, again, something that the spectac middle end can infer and make explicit for the benefit of some of the backends, like the cock one or the, the pros one. I think I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. There's some ambiguity here um, with this notation, which also exists with the overbar notation. But let me skip over that and instead talk about what we're actually producing here. We now have all these nice definitions and can process them, type check them, and, and so on and so forth. But our main point is that we want to produce some artifacts, right? So if you, for example, have these here, then we can now render the entire document as uh, the entire pros and and formal rules as needed for the spec document so this is really produced by our tool all the pros is generated automatically from just these rules and it's uh it's quite a bit more complicated than you might think at first so for example here's the rule for branches it has it consists of two rules right like a base case and an inductive case and the, the tool has to recognize that it has collate these two rules and in pros it has to generate like a, a conditional for that. And there can be quite a bit more complicated cases like this. Um, we can also generate cocks. So this is still work in progress, not even remotely as far as we have with the pros and generation. But just to give you an idea, here's like the, the inductive type we can generate from that for cock. Um, but there's more. So the way um, the process derived is basically by a transformation from the declarative reduction rules into algorithmic rules by a process that's reminiscent of what some of the and the result of that is an intermediate representation that we call AL, the algorithmic language inside the, the pipeline. And Essentially, you can think of it as an AST for the pros that we want to render afterwards. And because we have a nice AST for that, we can actually write an interpreter for that, right? So we can run the pros if you want. And by that, we can indirectly run actual WASM if we give it as input to this uh, meta level interpreter and the actual WASM spec written in spec tech. And by doing so, we can do that and we can actually pass the entire WASM test suite with that. So it's really complete enough to execute all of WASM. Um, and that has some very nice uh, um, implications. So it means that if we're actually able 
Well, let me start here. So first of all, one thing we haven't done yet is porting all the proofs we that the Wisdom Cert uh, team did before to the newly generated stuff. That's still work in progress. But when we once we're done with that, we know that this is like sound. And because it all comes from the same source, right, it's really a direct representation of the same thing that we see in the LaTeX in the rendered uh, standards document. We also are, have pretty high assurance that that what you actually read on paper is sound and well-formed. And similarly, by running the test suite, running the interpreter on the test suite with the input specification and passing that, we also know that all the pros that you actually read on paper or on your screen, if you prefer, uh, actually does what you think it does. I mean, there might still be bugs here in the pipeline, but that's much less likely than in a man fully manual translation where all you have is some like trust in your in the eyeball correspondence of the definitions, right? Here, it's really all automated, all coming from the same source. So we have a much higher level of assurance that what is in the actual document is sort of verified. And this is a level of assurance, I think, that no other language has achieved so far. So we're pretty happy about that. There are some limitations. Uh, I won't go into that here. We found, of course, various bugs in, in, the, in the specification by doing so. We injected old bugs that were already found into our tool and, and to figure out whether it will, would discover them. And it did in most cases. And there are, of course, classes of bugs that are now completely prevented by construction. So certain editorial anger, uh, errors like typos and wrong hyperlinks just won't happen anymore. Um, here's an example of a bug that was found. I'm gonna skip over that because I think I'm running out of time. Um, if you wanna have know more about all that, we recently had a paper accepted to PLDI, which, um, Dong Jun is going to present in two weeks in Copenhagen about um, what we found and what we did in detail. So the current status is that we have spec tech formulations of three versions of the language. Um, and we are in the process of converting the actual spec document to spec tech. And, and this can be done incrementally because the way it works is that you can insert splices into the like kind of little commands into the text document as is and then the tool runs over that and replaces these splices with the generated text or math so for example this is like some piece of the document how it looked before and this is what it turns into and all that's left here are these splice uh, uh, commands that tell you insert the rule heap type okay apps heap type here and then it will insert all the math and it will look more or less like on the left side after the pre-processing um as i said the the theorem prover backends are work in progress but really uh the here is like the the old document and the new document and it's not even the most up-to-date version because in, in the meantime, I also made uh, hyper-references work, so all that should be blue now as well and basically look almost exactly like the previous thing, except that this is all auto-generated and this was all manually written. Um, various open questions. Uh, I don't think, yeah, I have time for all of them. Also, if you want to ask me why we did not use Odd and Lamb there, bunch of points I can talk about, but I think I'm going to move to the summary right now. Um, so this, like, Wasm was, I think, the first really industrial strength programming language technology that came out with a fully formalized semantics. And that left, like, this big engineering problem. How are we going to make that work in the future with all the churn on the on the specification, on the actual design? How does that scale? And I think with SpecTech, we, we, we found a way to make that scale. Um, and we are hoping to be able to make that kind of like the main authoring tool in the future for future releases of the WebAssembly standard, um, which we're going to talk about on Thursday, I think. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Happy to take questions. All right, let's uh, thank Andreas.
there any questions for Andreas? We should use the mic. Hi, I have a question, which is, were there any cases where the prose you generate now is kind of slightly worse than the one you had beforehand, where you're thinking, oh, this text is now ever so slightly more difficult to understand, because maybe if you wrote the prose by hand, you could formulate yeah, yeah. this slightly nicer? Definitely. And there's still quite a bit of polishing to do in, in that regard. There are some cases where it basically infers a condition like a case split when it sh should really be able to say this is an assertion because we know this is true at that point. And there are like some things like, I don't know, when you have optional pieces, it also would formulate that in a weird way because it does it uniformly with other sequences. And there's still a bit of polishing to do in that regard. And, and we are working on that and basically incrementally improving the pros to look more like what you would expect um but i guess i mean you you can make that in in infinitely perfect right <laughs> it will never be quite as perfect as a handwritten manual thing but thanks other questions for andreas uh the scope of this, it sounds like, is execution and uh, validation. I was just wondering if there's any interest in uh, parsing or you know binary representation. Yeah. Thank you for that question, because actually we also can handle um, that. Sorry, I have to skip over some slides here. Right, so... One thing, one feature I did not talk about is that you can also define grammars. And that uh, corresponds to these attribute grammars that the spec is using for defining the, the binary and the text format. And you can do write that down literally, basically. So here's like some excerpt from the binary format for instructions. And it's really just like a grammar on the left-hand side. And this is what it infers, like the abstract syntax you get out of that. And then it can also render that in the way that the spec currently shows it. So we have done the whole binary format that way. I have not yet done the text format because that's a bit more tedious. That's that's one of the things still missing. There are basically two things we haven't formalized yet in spec tech. One is the text format and the other is numerics. Um, and that's essentially just for lack of time so far. You definitely want to do those two. Very cool. Thank you. Awesome. Let's thank Andreas again.